Um, Holly probably will. Okay, now it's, 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 it's I, I started it. recording. Good job. Okay, so before we, we dive in, let's get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Um, I hope that these continue to be helpful and um, supportive in terms of the things that you're, you're dealing with, which was just brought up by way of a question by Jay, and I think we'll, I will add that to the discussion this morning. Um, I'm Deb Radman, I'm your moderator today, and we um, have a few ground rules I always will go over. You guys are the best group when it comes to these. Um, you use the mute button, and um, if you have a question, please put it in chat so we can get um, your question um, on the on the table and, and discuss, and we, we want to share as much information as possible. Same thing as uh, if you have a, a point to share, um, do the same thing, because I'm monitoring that, and I will do everything to get you into the discussion with your point or your question. Um, and of course, this forum is, yay, being recorded. We are very happy we can figure that out. Um, let me hand it to Paul, who will just go over a few uh, things today about today's learning objectives, and um, we're off to the races. Paul. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Looks like we got another great attendance. Appreciate everybody's time on these. Uh, gosh, I think this is our, what, is this our 13th? Something like that. Something like that meeting. So really, thank everybody for, for chiming in. Like Deb had mentioned, to make sure you get into the chat box and let's get some questions out there. We want to be uh, sure that these are a value add and that they continue to be a value add to each one of you uh, out there as industry partners and contractor members. Um, we want to ensure that uh, you know with our speakers that we have each week, you know our SMEs. Um, we want to make sure that those are or what you need as an industry so please let us know um, what questions you have as far as maybe ideas for speakers moving forward from entities that you need to hear from so uh, we can try our hardest to get in touch with those individuals and and make these uh, uh, continue to uh, provide value to all of us so uh, we do plan on probably uh, at the end of the month or the beginning in July to spread these meetings out a little bit more, okay, so that they're not necessarily every single week. Uh, maybe we do them bi biweekly or, or monthly. Let's hear from you about what your thoughts are. If these are things that you would like to see still month or weekly, um, uh, we will still put them on, but we need your help with that because we want to make sure that you can uh, identify areas you need help with. Okay, so uh, we plan on spreading them out a little bit unless y'all as industry partners and contractors members uh, uh, communicate otherwise. Okay, so appreciate that. Um, we're on track with some great SMEs today. We've got uh, Mr. Londell. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I know that he'll be seeing a few things, uh, but we're going to talk about some inclusion and um, other topics like that. I'm not going to jump too far into it. I'll let the SMEs get into it. So I guess I'm going to pass it off right now to Marilyn Stansbury where she can do some introductions and get these, uh, uh, get this conversation going. Thank awesome. you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for being on the call today. Um, I'm just going to go through a little bit um, who we're going to hear from from a subject matter expertise. Uh, we'll start the morning off uh, with our normal top of mind, what's going on with COVID this week. Hopefully things have been um, calming a little bit, but I do know that there um, is always evolution to this. Uh, and uh, we'll hear uh, today from Kristen White with Fisher and Phillips, attorney at law. Um, and I just have to say, I always call her out for being amazing. Um, but today um, you will notice that she is drinking from a Wonder Woman mug. So, um, so now I'm gonna add superhero to her title. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Pete Aiden and Kurt Olson joining us from Whipley. Thank you so much, Pete. Pete is our treasurer on our board of directors and has been engaged in IEC for many, many years. And uh, we really appreciate Pete and Kurt joining us and lending their expertise on what's happening from the finance and tax liability and you know everything that impacts the running of the business. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> also joining us today is Brian Connor. 
with BOK Financial, you all will remember that Brian joined us during, excuse me, the, the PPP um, intense discussions. And I think that there are some updates and policies and, and things to share there. So Brian will, will speak to that. Uh, Paul mentioned that um, I, IECRM team member Londell Jackson, who is the uh, Education and Workforce Coordinator, will be joining us today. And also Leland Gutierrez. Leland uh, is the chair of our Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And if we weren't doing member forums, uh, today would have been our Diversity and Inclusion Committee meeting. So we are going to do a little bit of expansion uh, beyond top of mind. Uh, topics uh, to talk a little bit about workforce outreach and things that we are doing and understanding your needs. Uh, and then at eight o'clock, we are going to be joined by Betsy Markey. Betsy is the executive director of the State of Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. And Betsy will be sharing with us uh, what's happening from a State of Colorado perspective with the Economic Recovery Task Force, which she serves on for the governor, along with a lot of other uh, private sector leaders. So we'll hear from her uh, between 8 and 8.20 this morning. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deb to get our top of mind questions going. All right. Thank you, Marilyn. And uh, I think we're really looking forward for, uh, to hear from Betsy and also want to hear more today about your uh, own company successes and challenges with workforce development, which really is our topic today workforce development in uh, the face of COVID-19. And so um, I would like to start with Kristen and say, you know, Kristen, let's talk, what's top of mind for you? Um, I understand you've been working with the Public Health Department regulations and workplace visits this week. Is there anything new that we need to know? And uh, any um, trends you are spotting? Yeah, good morning. Um, one of the things that we've seen come up is, you know, in the um, PHO that came out, there was a sixth amended that came out on Monday. Uh, requirements are still pretty much the same that we've been working with um, through May. Um, but one of the things we noticed and that we're now seeing enforced is there's a provision in there, it's under section um, I, which is always hard because it's I-1 or I-2, which looks the same. Um, but they've got a provision in here that says if you have, so when you're doing your symptom checks, if you have two or more employees that have, you know, the symptoms that you're checking for, you're supposed to contact the local health department and then it has language that says cooperate in any disease outbreak investigations. So what we saw for one of our clients last week is they had two um, people that came down with COVID within 14 days of each other, um, but the people didn't work together at all. I mean, they were on different floors. Um, they didn't, they weren't friends and take breaks. So they conclude, you know, internally conclude this wasn't work related, but based on this language, they went ahead and they um, reported it. Um, the investigation that followed was really aggressive. And that's what I wanted to kind of alert this group to is that they got a call um, two owners, one of them got a call on her personal cell phone at like nine o'clock at night. You know, basically she'd gotten an email at three. She said, okay, I'll get back to you tomorrow. When that wasn't enough, they called her on her cell phone and said, no, we want this information tonight. We want it now. I mean, it was very um, aggressive. And there, that was, you know, their words that they used, um, that they wanted the information regarding everyone because they had had some positive cases back in March. And it was a large spreadsheet that they sent over that had the employees' names, addresses, phone numbers, symptoms, um, all their information. But then they wanted anyone who had symptoms, they wanted that same information as far as name, address, you know, had they been tested, um, what were the testing results. And so, you know, at first when they called on the phone, they said, we want anyone who's been sick and has any symptoms. And when I went and looked at their letter, the letter only refers to COVID symptoms. So I said, no, we're only going to give COVID symptoms and let them tell us why they need to know anyone who's had a stomach ache because we, we're not even tracking that information. So what she was getting told on the email was different than the telephone, right? So the telephone, they kept trying to broaden the request. So we limited it to just COVID symptoms, but they then had um, one of the, the four people that had COVID symptoms all tested negative. 
two of those people told the employer they did not want their names and addresses on this list because the list from what we were told the local health department sends it to the state. Their feeling was, look, I tested negative. I don't want my name and address and phone number out there on some, we don't know where it's going. Um, so we left it with putting employee A and employee B and we told the health department, look, this employee has not authorized us to release their information. They've not tested positive, they've tested negative. So we think that gives them grounds to be able to push back a little bit. Um, and, you know, I told, you know, we left it with the employer. My advice to them was, look, you know, ultimately you may have to produce this information because you have it in your employer files. And so based on this public health order, I think that the safety is gonna override the employee privacy. But that's where we started. We haven't heard back yet. As I said, look, since they've tested negative, I'm not sure what their basis is going to be to continue to push it. If they had tested positive, I get it. We've got to give the names and everything. So I just wanted to alert this group. This is kind of the first, um, and we've seen some investigations, some follow-up by the health department as far as, hey, who's tested positive? We need their names, right? Because they're doing contract tracing. But this is the first time that we've dealt with kind of a pretty aggressive investigator who was demanding documents. Um, I think my email to Maryland was more aggressive than OSHA, right? OSHA at least gives you a few days to respond. And this was, you know, I need this right now. I need this right now. I need this today. So, you know, just be aware of, um, you know, trying to kind of put them at bay a little bit because you're going to have to take time to put this document together that they want. And then also giving your employees notice that you're releasing this information. Um, I think that's a good, you know, even though to me, I think ultimately you'll have to, I do always think it's a good idea when you give employee information to a government agency, you tell that employee that, hey, we were required and we had to give them your information because that way they're not surprised if they get a phone call. Um, but yeah, that, so that, that's what's been kind of, I guess, the, the turn of events for us um, this week. Wow. I, privacy becomes a real issue all of a sudden, does it not? Mm -hmm. and, and I guess you know, what you're saying is safety will trump privacy in these cases. And I, I guess I wonder how, um, how do we balance that with keeping things private and not giving out information that we don't need to give. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, think that's a challenge. It's it is. It's a real challenge. That's why I think, you know, I thought this employer drew a good balance that the positive cases, they gave the names. And then on the symptoms, you know, we had two employees that said fine. We had two that said no. So we chose to not release their information and then see, we haven't yet gotten as far as I know, we haven't yet gotten pushed back on those two since they tested negative. But yeah, it is. I mean, it's, you know, with, with the language in these protective health order or the public health order, I mean, saying you must cooperate. I mean, it's, you know, they're putting it out there that, um, yeah, safety is going to override it. So yeah, so just be cautious with it. Like I said, talking with your employee, yeah. letting them know what's going on. That's always the best thing to do before you turn over that information. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Pete, let's go over to the administrative side of things and talk about the PPP and um, the new changes there, tax filings um, and or industry trends, especially related to workforce impact. What's, what's happening? Sure. And I'll let the uh... Kurt chime in here too on the PPP loans, but obviously last time we spoke last week, we, um, Trump had uh, the legislation on his desk to sign and um, he, he has signed that and it's been put into effect. Um, so there's changes there. A um, couple other things that are top of mind for me is there is some, a little bit of a David Scott update here. Um, so there's some bills in the in the Colorado state legislature that are just in my opinion really bad and scary um, one of which is regarding tax filings and how they're looking to potentially change them from how Colorado has always kind of followed the federal laws to not doing that anymore so that is um, up for debate still but uh, that's that's in there um, another one regarding landlords and 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 potentially giving people this crazy amount of time that it would take to a victim and, and such. So a lot of stuff happening in regards to that that's all somewhat related to COVID um, and, and 
those things that are going on. Um, tax filing deadlines right now for um, um, anything that was normally April 15th have, has been pushed to July 15th. Um, also, first quarter and second quarter estimate payments are also July 15th. And however, there are some states that still have um, their first quarter or they're actually their second quarter estimates are June 15th prior to the first quarter estimate payments. So it's, it's to say it's a little confusing is, is kind of an understatement. So there's a lot going on there and, and just need to be aware that just because you hear all these things about what's going on at the federal level doesn't necessarily translate to the state level. Um, Kurt, you so want Pete, to could you could you be a little more specific on um, the new legislation surrounding the PPP um, for those of us who have not necessarily been following it day to day like you are? Um, it's been signed into law, but what are the new provisions? Yeah, I'll let Kurt speak to that. Yeah. Okay, Kurt. The big update that I guess has happened in the last week or so is that they have extended the eligible period to uh, will give you the option to either select eight weeks or 24 weeks for the eligible period. So it does give companies a lot of lot more time to incur those eligible costs so that more of the loan can be forgiven. So that's, okay, thank that's the you. big change that's okay. happened. Okay. Um, uh, Pete, back to you. Um, it, during your David Scott moment, you mentioned that um, the tax filings, um, there's, there's legislation here in Colorado, and can you tell me a little bit more about um, what the bill is proposing? Yeah, so it's looking at things such as, you know, if you have an NOL at the, at the individual level, um, for example, um, and you're able to carry it back for federal tax purposes and potentially go back and get refunds at the at that level it would not allow that to happen at at the uh, Colorado level um, and so it'd create a, a whole bunch of timing differences between what's going on on your on individuals tax return um, from federal to to the state level um, in, complicating a lot of things, changing the way Colorado has always kind of processed tax returns for as long as I can remember. Um, so just a lot of, uh, I guess, little nitty gritty details in there that, you know, from, from my point of view, I guess, look very negative. Um, and we can give a more of a, a detail update on that if, if you guys would like or send out um, kind of a, hey, here's a synopsis of what we see in this, this bill. We'd be happy to do that. Deb, if I could add, Alan, um, Pete, thank, yeah. thank you for, um, for bringing those two pieces of legislation up. I will get in touch with uh, Jay Hicks and make sure that we've added those to our tracker if they aren't already. I don't remember seeing particularly what you mentioned about the landlords and eviction, um, but I will make sure that both of those are on the tracker and that, and that we've got them working on them throughout the rest of the session. But you, um, yeah. you are right, and David Scott might even chime in later. Um, yeah, there's some crazy legislation uh, in this uh, running through right now. Yeah. Um, okay, one question from um, Jason. Uh, Kurt, this is for you. Is the is the PPP either either eight or twenty four weeks, or any period up to twenty four weeks? Okay. Yeah. As of right now, it's eight or twenty four. So the the big, I guess, trip with going with the twenty four period is that's that at the end of the twenty four week period is when you have to reassess your uh, full time equivalent headcount. So that's the one downside is you have to project out to that 24 week period for that. Okay. And, and where do you go or what do you have to do in order to select which one? You don't have to do, you, it's not an election you have to make, you can just extend normally without oh, doing okay. anything for it. Okay, all right. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and Pete, I know we're gonna lose you at eight so thanks a lot for the input. I think that some of this information, uh, well, all of the information is, is really um, 
good stuff and we need to stay on top of it. Um, let's move over to Brian and talk a little bit about what's coming down from a banking finance um, bonding or any other economic standpoint. Yeah, I think the biggest thing top of mind, uh, much like with Pete and Kurt, is the update to the PPP. Um, in addition to that eight weeks going to 24 weeks, they move the amount that has to be used for payroll down from 75% to 60%. So all the changes, I mean, all the changes were good. Um, your payback period, if you have a portion of it that's not forgiven, has been pushed from two years to five years. Uh, and then you've got, you've got until the end of the year, instead of, instead of the end of this month, to get your levels back to where they were pre-COVID. I think they're taking February 15th as that cutoff date. And then in addition to that, they've granted some safe harbors. Uh, if you were, you know, if companies couldn't come back up because of state regulation, also if you tried to rehire individuals and they declined, uh, they're allowing you to, they're allowing you safe harbor there if you don't hit that amount. Um, and then I would say the only other one, I mean, there's quite a, a few other ones, but another major one is that they move that deferred payments instead of six months, it's now to 10 months. Okay. Well, there's a little more flexibility there then. Um, and that's, that's helpful. Um, Kristen, is there going to be another executive order um, coming down anytime soon to your knowledge? Are you thinking on the state level? Yeah. Um, I think the, the one that just came out on, or the public health order that just came out on Monday in response to the executive order last week um, goes through, I believe, the end of June. So I think we're under, you know, they've been making little tweaks here and there, which is really aggravating because they don't give us a red line and tell us what the changes are. Um, but, you know, because we're on like the sixth amended, amended but I think we're where we're at, at least for probably the next two to three weeks is my guess. We may see some little tweaks, but I think big changes will, we are where we're at for a couple of weeks, but maybe I'll say something different next week, but that's definitely my feeling this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Leland, um, today would have um, been the diversity and inclusion committee meeting, which spends a lot of time on workforce outreach development and, and workforce retention. Um, what has COVID meant for the industry's workforce efforts? Um, what and how are things changing as we think about hiring, work, future recruitment, and, and that kind of, uh, those kinds of things? Well, I think our world has really changed. Um, we, are trying to shift and uh, adapt to the way in which we recruit. Uh, we'll be doing our first um, recruitment with the virtual career fair with IEC, uh, I believe this Thursday. And um, we're gonna definitely, that'll be our first time doing virtual interviews and virtual uh, career fairs. Um, we've changed our um, online application and interviewing process to move to phone call and video conference um, if possible. Uh, I would say that what we're seeing with the applications, I guess, the application volume, usually we have quite a few that would come in online. I'm not sure if everybody's seeing this, but we're starting to see a slowdown. Maybe we'll get one every couple days applicants online, whether it be someone experienced or someone totally green but um, we're not really seeing too many people applying for jobs uh, or inquiring for jobs with us. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that we can utilize the virtual career fair as a way to recruit uh, talent. Um, we have seen a significant increase of uh, unemployment claims. I'm sure everyone else has. Not so much from those of recent departure from the company, but um, some who have possibly left the company a year or two ago uh, coming through for unemployment claims. So um, those continue to rise. Uh, we have been able to success successfully bring back uh, one employee who had left voluntarily uh, to take some time and we were able to bring that person back into the fold and try to, try to get um, experienced electricians back into uh, our workforce. 
So from a outreach standpoint, we can try to market and attract talent as much as possible remotely, if that really is uh, a way, I, I guess it, it's, uh, it's, it's something new that we're really trying to work on. It, it, it's more of a, a trust type of uh, scenario where you're trusting what is written in the application and then trying to uh, discuss that virtually or remotely. And then in, you know, the few hires that we have been able to do during this time have been um, when they come in for an orientation, which is kept in a separate room type of area. Um, that's really the first time we actually meet any applicant that would come into the company. So that's, that's taking some getting used to for us. Yeah, I bet. I mean, from, uh, from an employer standpoint, meeting in person has always been so important. I know for myself, uh, I, you get a gut feel for somebody when you, when you do that. And it's very difficult to do that over uh, a Zoom meeting. Um, it's, it's real different. So um, thank you, Leland. Uh, you, Londell, um, Leland did mention the career fair. And so uh, could you just give us a little bit more uh, information about it? And um, it really looks like it's changing. This will be our first attempt at doing something like this online. But it's like the future of the workforce has accelerated 10 years in just three months. Um, so, uh, take it away. Certainly. Um, yes. So our, uh, virtual career fair is this Thursday, uh, the 11th from three o'clock until four o'clock. And, um, we would love to have, um, even more contractors, um, participate. Um, and I would say even if those contractors, um, don't have, or, or currently don't have open positions. Um, we see this as an opportunity not just to uh, recruit individuals uh, for open positions, but to share uh, what you do in within the industry. Um, these individuals um, are coming to this career fair not just to look for a job, but also to gain an understanding about what does it mean to work within the electrical industry. Um, and that's what I do as far as workforce development. Um, I go out into the community and help individuals, whether they are youth, whether they're young adults, or whether they are um, older adults, um, whether they are first careers or second careers or third or fourth or whatever career they're looking at, um, and help them understand what it means to be an electrician. Um, what it means to work within the uh, electrical industry alongside an electrician. Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I can only tell so much of that story. And so it's very important to have other individuals who work within the industry to, to share that, that, that information. Because these um, ladies and gentlemen that will participate within this event, um, they need to have a very broad and very um, uh, uh, precise understanding of what their opportunities are. Because if they're like myself and they pretty much have a fairly narrow understanding of what it means to work, um, what, the, what, what the electrical industry is. Um, and so I think it's um, just very important from a workforce development understanding um, to provide that information. And so to the point of being able to have a virtual platform, um, you know, I know that, you know, it is very important to, and, and it's prime opportunity to have someone have that face-to-face -face opportunity to have that conversation. Um, but we don't have that luxury right now. And so the next best thing is to have a virtual face-to-face. -face. Um, and additionally, um, we are asking all the participants to submit their information and indicate which organizations they would like to have further conversations with. And then we will distribute that information to the contractors so that they can make that one-on-one -on -one connection 
um, whether that's by phone, whether that's by Zoom or any other virtual platform, or when it's allowable, um, that face-to-face -face contact so that it can grow into something that is um, more amenable to um, whatever that means for that, the, that relationship. So, um, Great, great. I want to jump on oh, that. Thank you. Uh, Londell, thank you so much. And, and, and um, jumping back into the opportunity for the contractor uh, piece on this, and that is we just don't know currently, you know, what the future has in store. So this might be great practice for a contractor who, who has never done a virtual career fair, who might not need manpower now, but moving forward with projects and as things open up, this might be a great way for them to get introduced into a you know, a uh, digital online meeting platform where re you're recruiting for your workforce. So yeah. it's a, just, uh, I just, I think just to chime in and, and uh, see what it's all about because you might have to, you might not need it now, but you might have to participate in one later on down the road. And yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you, Paul. I, I think it's going to be a good event. And so, you know, if you can, please, please join. Um, and now I'd like to um, move on, on a little bit and uh, welcome Betsy Markey uh, to, the, to the forum. And Marilyn, would you do the honors? I would be happy to. Betsy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I've uh, shared with Betsy a little bit about um, IEC Rocky Mountain and our background and who we are and what we do. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about Betsy's background so you know um, um, where she's coming from uh, with her perspective today. Uh, Betsy was appointed by Governor uh, Polis uh, uh, as, as a member of his cabinet. She's the executive director of the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade and has served in that role for now uh, about 18 months or so. She has over 30 years of leadership experience in government and the private sector. She's worked in four federal agencies, including the Treasury, the Department of State, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and um, as the regional administrator for the Western US for the Small Business Administration. So she absolutely understands what's happening uh, with, our, uh, with our employers uh, and businesses throughout the state. Uh, she is a former member of Congress representing the 4th Congressional District and served on the Transportation and Agricultural Committees. Uh, Bet Betsy is also a business owner uh, again, uh, bringing that perspective of the private sector. Uh, and we're uh, looking forward to hearing from Betsy as she can share with us what's happening uh, from a statewide perspective related to COVID, any top of mind updates that Betsy might have, um, as well as specifically the governor's economic uh, recovery task force and things that, that, that we can know and do in order to be engaged in, and involved uh, as an industry in that effort. Betsy, thank you so much. Hey, thank, thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, everyone, for giving me a few minutes of your uh, of your time this morning. Um, I just want to be uh, give you a brief overview of some of the things our office is doing, and then I'm happy to open it up for for questions and and how uh, we might be able to have a have maybe a stronger partnership um, moving forward. So, uh, as you all know, it's it's pretty bleak right now. We're in the midst of just starting to to try to to get ourselves out of of uh, the response mode um, to COVID. 19 um, and into recovery. Um, I just saw an article today that um, around the country through February and April, 3.3 um, million businesses closed around the country. And that's more businesses than the entire business, number of businesses that closed during, during the Great Recession. Um, just in terms of uh, in Colorado, um, in terms of uh, renewable energy jobs, um, we've lost about 6,000 jobs um, in this sector, which is about 9% of the workforce. So um, we have a lot of work to do to get our, um, our economy back on track. Um, we are continuing, the governor is continuing to cautiously reopen uh, different sectors of the economy. Of course, you know, all, all the essential businesses um, have been open um, throughout the, um, uh, the response period, um, certainly construction industry, uh, but starting to open up more um, of the outdoor recreation sector, um, you know, the, the 
hotel tourism sector slightly opening up businesses, retail, um, which I think is good news for all aspects of the economy to, to get those uh, businesses up and running. Uh, but we know that's not easy, that they're going to need a lot of support. Um, so I want to touch on a, a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, I just want to make sure that if you have any um, questions at all on and any guidance that's required, whether it's um, you know PPE required, mass required, other things for for businesses to reopen, um, really the best resource is uh, ColoradoSaferAtHome.com. That's ColoradoSaferAtHome.com, and that has again uh, for every uh, industry sector, it has a guidance for. Um, employers, employees, and customers as well. So make sure you use that um, as a resource. Um, we are, and, and part of this came out of the, uh, the governor's Economic Stabilization and Recovery um, Council, which was stood up a, a couple of months ago and, and includes over 200 uh, private sector folks from um, every county in, in Colorado and, and uh, have different uh, task forces on you know, tourism and arts and culture and the energy sector, um, agriculture, transportation, um, and financial services. And one of the uh, things that has come out of the financial services committee, it's, I think the um, task force has enabled us to have a better public-private partnership, but we are putting together a couple of different recovery funds. Um, that hopefully we'll be able to roll out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and they include number one, what we're calling the um, Energized Colorado Gap Fund. Um, and it looks like uh, the legislature will be giving us about $20 million in federal CARES Act money. And these are <clears throat> going to be loans and grants, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to the very smallest businesses, and they'll be um, really focused on women and minority owned businesses. Uh, those companies who may not have received PPP for some reason, maybe they were denied, maybe for some reason uh, they didn't qualify, but we know they've fallen through the gaps. Um, and we know that of all of the businesses that are closed, it's been disproportionately minority owned businesses um, and disproportionately black owned businesses. So we're, we're focusing, on, focusing this gap fund um, on that sector with both loans and with CARES Act money that will enable us to uh, give out some grants as well. Uh, we know that as, as a lot of companies reopen, they're gonna need to buy new things, uh, whether it's uh, uh, PPE, um, plexiglass, you know, um, protective gear for their employees. And, and this stuff's not cheap. So we're hoping to use those, that kind of funding uh, for those businesses. <clears throat> uh, we're also putting together, uh, we're calling the Climber Fund, which is a Colorado um, Main Street Recovery Fund. And this is hopefully will grow to be a $250 million fund um, for businesses a little bit larger, more in like the 25 to 50 employee size, uh, that it's, it's going to be a combination of, of some state funding um, and uh, private investment funding, again, for businesses as they, as they recover. Um, we are also, if, if you haven't used them, uh, we operate 15 small business development centers um, around Colorado. They provide free or low cost consulting to businesses. We've got about 300 uh, certified business consultants um, who are, you, you know, in, in every field of business, whether it's, you know, marketing support, financial support, um, uh, they can, um, uh, questions on supply chain issues, uh, they can help you through this. So that's uh, the small business development centers. And the last thing I want to talk about that we're standing up um, is a partnership with lawyers around Colorado. You know, we know as we start to recover, businesses are also going to need some legal support. How do they comply if you've gotten uh, Paycheck Protection Program funds or funds from SBA? Um, how do you comply with making sure that you're doing all the paperwork right? Um, if you've been denied federal support, maybe you need to talk to an attorney about that. If you need to restructure your business. Um, so we've got about 50 law firms that are interested in providing some uh, pro bono services. So hopefully we'll be rolling out that program um, by the end of the week, um, and we'll put that, make sure that's on our website, um, which is choosecolorado.com. And so if you have any questions about any of the things that I've talked about, just go to choosecolorado.com. 
Um, you can also follow us on LinkedIn. Um, again, just you know, just go to choose just to the Colorado Office of Economic Development. We have a lot of good information um, there about that. So, so we again, we know we've got a lot of work to do. We are, you know, on the bright side of things. I would say is that there has been an uptick um, just over the last couple of weeks that we are found um, of businesses who are interested in uh, maybe expanding their business um, into Colorado or moving from another state into Colorado, whether it's you know, manufacturing or, or professional services headquarters, um, getting a lot of interest, uh, for instance, from California, as uh, you know, a lot of that economy is still closed. Some of those companies are looking to go someplace else. And I think we, we try to promote Colorado as a, um, as a really great place to relocate. We've got a business friendly environment. We've got a lot of skilled employees here. So we are ramping up uh, those our, our business development efforts to uh, try to attract some of those new companies um, into Colorado to uh, provide those uh, good paying jobs. Um, and along with that, you know, we know that we've, we've heard from a lot of businesses um, about disruptions in their supply chain um, and really working with manufacturers here in Colorado to um, uh, help shorten their supply chain. We don't have that many contract manufacturers here who can easily switch to manufacturing uh, new products uh, that may be um, uh, more needed during this time and, and really working with our manufacturing um, community. Um, as just one example, we've had a couple of manufacturers in the outdoor recreation space, ones like uh, Funkin and um, Osprey, who have switched from making outdoor gear to making masks. So we've got five or six of our manufacturers in the outdoor rec industry who have been producing masks. So they've made over 100,000 masks that we've been able to distribute to businesses all over Colorado um, uh, at a very low cost or free of charge. Our manufacturers have also gotten together to make sure that they know how people can get PPE supplies. Um, because some of them are switching from being a, a distiller uh, to, to making hand sanitizer. Um, and you can find a lot of that kind of, of uh, uh, manufacturing supplies um, on a, a group that we partnership partner with, um, and that's Energize Colorado. Uh, I think that's another great resource to go to. They are, there are uh, private sector partners in the small business space, um, and you can go to their marketplace and uh, look at ways that you're able to uh, purchase uh, through Colorado manufacturers um, PPE supplies. Uh, but with that, that's a lot of information I, I gave you in a short period of time. Um, I want to really hear from you what your, what your questions are. So um, it's great stuff and we're gonna get a lot of, uh, get all the links and everything in the recap. Marilyn, you wanted to chime in here. I was just going to say, Betsy, you did a fantastic job um, of summarizing so many of the topics that we have been covering on these weekly member forums. Um, we started, uh, I think, our second week by having a representative um, from a Small Business Development Center uh, to, to begin helping uh, with the PPP uh, application process and understanding it. Um, in fact, even before the regulations came out, uh, you know, we were, we were guessing at what we might see, uh, you know, or early on. And, um, uh, and you mentioned uh, the diversity and inclusion uh, and what you're doing to try to make sure that all businesses um, have uh, some ability to, 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 get, to, to garner support, to have support. Uh, and today would have been our diversity and inclusion meeting. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we talk about is uh, both from a workforce development standpoint, attracting people into the industry but also how are we making sure that businesses um, you know, grow and, and, uh, and are able uh, to, to, to increase in their diversity. So thank you so much for, for, for touching on those topics. Um, we do have a couple of um, manufacturer representatives and uh, industry partners that, uh, that deal with distribution as well as some of our contractors. So um, if, if anybody does have questions, we have, uh, about five more minutes or so uh, of Betsy's time. And I, um, I'd love to hear uh, from you um, what you would like to share with Betsy. Um, and also, um, you know, these are companies that are leaders in their communities. Um, what, what can we do to, to be a stronger partner with you? 
anybody. Um, I think I think Marilyn, that uh, last question you posed uh, to Betsy is really um, twofold. One, um, how can we and what should we be doing as a trade association um, and as private uh, businesses uh, get information out to our members and also uh, what do you need from us in terms of uh, the job you're trying to do? I know that the, you know, the task force is, is underway and I think we really want to hear what can we do to be of more service to what you need to accomplish? Sure. Well, let me just touch on, on the task force. Um, you, you know, they, they were put together to really put, to give some short-term recommendations uh, for, for recovery. And so they went to work very quickly, um, have produced over 200 recommendations um, that fall into uh, a couple of buckets. One, um, what, uh, what support, additional support do we need from the federal government? And so we've uh, put together a couple of, of letters that have gone to our federal delegation and leadership in Congress from the governor you know, and from the chair of the council, Federico Pena, um, about what the federal government you know, can do to help Colorado. So those have been sent. The second bucket of recommendations uh, were with regard to what the state legislature um, can focus on. And so uh, we had uh, recommendations that are now being considered uh, by the state legislature. One of them is this $250 million fund um, uh, that would need some uh, first loss funds uh, from, from the state. And we've got a creative way to, to do that. That was one of the recommendations, several others as well that they're contemplating right now. Um, the third bucket was a reopen guidance that was suggested. Um, of course, and that was all being taken under consideration by uh, the Colorado Public Health and Environment, and then other just sort of other other messaging or other suggestions. So these the, the work of the council is largely wrapped up in terms of the full council. They're now being. Um, used on an ad needed basis, but the legislature will be um, adjourning either the end of this week or next week. And so a lot of those uh, like initial recommendations um, have been completed. Of course, the work is not done, but um, the council is not meeting as, as uh, often um, as they were. Not, nonetheless, we're keeping them um, informed as we, um, uh, you know, as we continue to need them in, in different sectors. I would say, um, and I'd love to follow up with a couple of different links, you know, certainly um, signing up for our newsletter. Um, I would say certainly following us on, us on LinkedIn. And I think one way for you all in particular to get involved is, and you may be already, we have an advanced industry program, a grant program that, I, that was started actually during the last recession to help diversify Colorado's economy and make sure we're supporting those industries uh, that provide the good paying jobs. Um, and they are, uh, and they fall into seven, seven basically industry categories. We have renewable energy, um, aerospace and defense, electronics, advanced manufacturing, biosciences, um, I'm missing one or two, high tech. Um, but I, I would also say, we, so we have these grant applications go out twice a year to businesses who need some proof of concept or some really startup capital um, in these areas. And uh, we have panels of industry experts who are, who are um, uh, who are basically choosing these companies to win these grants. It can go up to $250,000 grants for these businesses um, in, in the advanced industries. I think that's a really great way for um, industry groups to get involved uh, because you know a lot, a lot of the work being done in, in, again in renewable energy electronics by this group uh, I think would really dovetail nicely into our advanced industry program. Would love to get some of your membership on our committees to evaluate these companies that are applying for these grants. So I think that's, you know, in addition to getting information, I think that that's a, a, a really good way to, to get involved. You know, we, like every other agency, it's been a really tough budget year and we had our budget um, cut by quite a bit, 27%. Um, however, we were able to protect, for the most part, that really important grant program um, for our uh, advanced industry sector. So we're we're happy about that. So I, again, I think that that's one one good area for for involvement. 
and I can send you a link on, uh, to the person who runs that program in our office if you're not already involved. Now that would be great because we do put out a recap with the helpful and informative links in it. And so if we can get, get any and all of the links that you mentioned today, uh, I know some of us have written it down. We have a recording of this meeting, but we'd like to just get whatever else you can send us. You, you bet, you bet. I'll put them all in one place so it's, it's easy. Okay. Sorry. Perfect. Thank you so much, Betsy. You bet. All right, Marilyn. Well, Betsy, I just, again, want to thank you. Um, I will follow up. Um, you can send the links to me um, via my email, and I'll get them to the rest of the team. Uh, that, that recap will go out uh, to all of our members that are both on the call as well as, to, as well as to our full membership. So, you know, we know that some people may not be able to join us every Wednesday morning, but, uh, but we're sending this out to our entire, to our entire membership. And right. um, beyond COVID, anything that we can do to be a partner um, with the Office of Economic Development. Um, a couple of our members serve on local workforce development boards. Uh, you know, they're again, leaders and engaged in the community, but the more we can do, the more we're helping all of our, our business owners uh, that are part of the association. Great, great. Well, I'm gl glad to hear that you're part of the workforce development boards. You know, we work very closely with Colorado Office of Labor and Employment, with Joe Barella, his team, with the Future of Work office there, um, and and uh, so that, so that's that's a good good partnership. And I would say, uh, you know, as you look through some of these links, if you have have questions or if you have ideas, we lo always love to hear ideas on how the state can do a better job um, supporting supporting small businesses, which is really the back, you know, 98% of the businesses in Colorado, you know, under the SBA definition of under 500 employees are small businesses. So any ideas on how we can maybe do things better or differently, always open to hear that. So thanks Fantastic. for that. We have, we have, we have appreciated the, the essential designation uh, throughout this process. Um, we've worked very closely with the state on a couple of different things, yeah. Dora specifically, um, throughout yeah. this process. And um, again, really appreciate your time. And um, if anybody does have a question, Betsy has to go to another meeting, but wave if you want to ask a question um, before we, we let her sign off. Oh, David Scott. It, David. Oh, you're muted, David. There you go. Yep, there you go. I just wanted to, to uh, echo Marilyn's comments. I mean, uh, about uh, our designation is essential. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. I, and on behalf of our guys, they, they thank you. And, and our, our ladies as well, they absolutely, they are they're just uh, really, really grateful. Yeah. And we're continuing to hire. Um, you, you, you joined us when we were talking about our virtual career fair that we are trying out tomorrow. Uh, and uh, this is a busy hiring season typically. Uh, but we still have, um, while there have been some layoffs in some companies, um, we are still hiring uh, within the electrical industry and, and that shortage of skilled trades isn't gonna change. Right. Which is another reason that we wanna make sure that, that we can be a partner at the state level as we're looking at the economic recovery. There are a lot of opportunities in this industry for people that now may be interested in changing careers that and 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 that's great to hear and and if there's a way that we can support through you know some limited training grants to to retrain people for uh you know different jobs um love to be a part of that well, well thank you all for having me today Good fantastic luck. thank you betsy thank, thank you, you. Betsy. thank you betsy thank you okay okay so in the next few minutes um, we have left. Does anyone have any um, information you want to share or questions you would like to ask any of our subject matter experts um, on the platform today? Okay, I, then um, Marilyn. Um, I, I, um, I, have two I have two questions and they're both um, Kristen um, specific. One of them is um, just informationally, did you know about this um, pro bono legal defense fund or legal fund that the state was putting together? And is that something that Fisher and Phillips may be involved in? Um, that's one question. And then the second mm -hmm. question, I'm gonna go back to our early uh, before call conversation. And that's um, 
if you know if any uh, companies have been dealing with the question that Jay asked about, um, you know, can you participate in a in an industry event or or semi work related event, um, you know, what kind of um, what kind of permissions or um, expectations should companies be setting so that we have this we have this clay shoot coming up, which is why Jay was asking the question. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we don't get employees in trouble by signing up to attend if they have different uh, company policies in place. Yeah, um, the state fund, I, or the state program, I'd not heard about, so that was that was good information. I actually had written that down to follow up on to see what that is, because um, some of it may depend on if it's labor and employment related versus, like she mentioned, restructuring and things like that that are you know outside of of our expertise. But you know, definitely want to look into that. Um, for the clay event, you know, I, I would think that the place you're going is likely that they're the ones that are going to have to put into place the restrictions and requirements that the, the in, in the PHO, right? So making sure they have social distancing. My guess is they're going to have releases that you're going to have to sign um, because you're, you know, it's outside of an employee relationship. So we are seeing releases there. But yeah, I would think, you know, we have seen some employers that are prohibiting their employees from um, participating like traveling or participating so yeah maybe something to make sure um, people have run up the chain because we have run into employers that um, are prohibiting their employees from you know going to anything with like more than 10 people or anything like that um, especially since this is pseudo work right so mm -hmm. um, we always tell employers to be very careful and not comment on what your employees do in their personal time um, you know, you can ask them not to go to concerts and things, but they can obviously do what they want. But since this is, you know, really kind of industry work related, I would say it would probably make sense to check on that. But yeah, I would expect that the place you all are going for the clay shoot um, would be following all of those requirements because they're the ones that really have to, you know, make sure they're following it or their business would get shut down. So I would think they would have it all in place for everyone. Yeah. Well, thanks to Fisher and Phillips, we actually have two forms of liability um, coverage. Um, one is what the play shoot uh, uh, organization puts in place, and the other one is what we put in place um, as, <laughs> as even extra protection. Uh, thank you, Kate Robbie. Um, mm -hmm. And um, um, so we, you know, we're we're putting even more restrictive, um, um, uh, like requiring mask wearing, not just recommending mask wearing. Right. Them. So. Yeah, and that's great. And I would expect that the the place there, I don't know if they will, I mean, they may require it as well with masks, um, even though it's outdoors. Yeah, I don't know what, what they yeah. said what their policy is. Yeah. Well, there there are um, significant changes um, that, that they are implementing. Um, and we aren't their first tournament, so they will have had some experience before we get there at the end of June. Yeah, that's I don't, good. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if they're uh, requiring or recommending, uh, recommending um, but I believe they're recommending um, yeah. well, about we, gun-toting guys. Well, but, we're, we're providing masks and- Totally get it, so. totally get it, totally get it. I'm just, I'm just yeah. preparing us for some, some uh, figuring out how we're gonna deal with it, right? Because yeah. that's gonna be probably a, a, a challenge for us, so. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe not for um, this conversation though. No, 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 no. I, I get it. We, it was a long one in the other day in the other meeting, but uh, just, I just was trying to put that up front. No, it's a terrific question. And um, I think one of the things that'll be interesting to uh, know is after the clay shoot, how it all worked for everyone. And um, I would just be one last question before I turn it over to Marilyn to wrap us up. Is there anybody, um, on the forum today who has uh, written policies around uh, your employees attending industry work-related events? Because um, I know that's what prompted Jay's question and I know we've got this event coming up. Um, okay, well as, oh, Krista. Krista, did you want to say something? Yeah, we don't really have policies. We just have to report where we were, um, kind of the situation we were in. Um, if we go to some sort of event and nobody's wearing masks and there's hundreds of people, that kind of thing, we just have to report where we were. 
Um, and like I said, the kind of situation that we were in. Yeah, we were somewhere, there was 100 people, everybody was wearing masks, we were all safe. That kind of thing, because then, you know, when you bring that back into the workplace, you know, um, they want to know exactly, you know, what happened. We do actually report in every single day, every one of our employees, us as managers, we report in every single day who's at the office, um, you know, the times that we're in the office, that kind of thing. And we do have another spreadsheet that we do report if there's any kind of extracurricular activities, not obviously not, oh, we had a barbecue this weekend. But if there are events that we do attend um, outside of work, work events, things like that, just in case these things do happen um, and something yeah. does come up. So we do have to report those things, but we don't tell them they can't go. We just tell them, use your best judgment. Yeah, yeah. Good, thank you so much, Krista. Um, Marilyn, um, let's wrap up and uh, also give us a plug for next week's forum. Will do. So Brian, Kristen, Pete, Kurt, Leland, Londell, uh, all of you who participated in the call, thank you again for sharing your expertise uh, and your ongoing top of mind issues. Krista, it's so great to see you. Thank you for um, providing us uh, the input that, that, that you did on what's happening. Um, you've had a lot of COVID experience in the last uh, quarter of the year. Can you all believe it's been a quarter of a year uh, that we've been dealing with this? Uh, so um, anyway, uh, next week we are going to be um, expanding, uh, still doing top of mind as we have been, uh, but next week we also are going to uh, be doing a little bit of government relations recap because we will have uh, ended the session or be very close to the end of the session. So we'll wanna give those updates on uh, you know, how that has provided closure. And we also wanna talk a little bit about what's changing from a project management and, and how we're doing business standpoint. Uh, so um, you know, what's, what's, what's different about the way in which we're doing business now as we're beginning to open up and come back in uh, specifically uh, from, a, from a GC and, and a project management standpoint. So join us next week. Um, also next week, uh, and you'll see this in the recap, uh, also on Wednesday uh, during the lunch hour is our monthly IECRM and NECA inspector meeting. Uh, they're now being held via Zoom. And this is an opportunity for the electrical industry and our electrical inspectors to um, share ideas on code interpretation and make decisions so that, uh, so that in inspections and code uh, are uh, handled consistently and uh, across uh, the region. Uh, so join uh, that uh, next Wednesday over the lunch hour as well. Uh, that link will be on our website as well as in the recap notes. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you, Marilyn, for yes. that point. Appreciate Thank that. you, everybody. Thank David you. Jones, <laughs> Leland, put that up again. <laughs> oh, that's Let's awesome. Look it up a little higher. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks, Leland. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I uh, love you. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Where, where'd Steve go? Steve was on earlier. He may have had to drop off. So fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, part everybody. Of today. Great job, everybody. Out there. Thanks, guys. Jonesy, good to see you, man. You as well, my friend. We'll see y'all later. Adios. Later, Leland. And we'll start booting people. Steve, uh, Collie, up. Oh, he jumped off. Uh, he jumped off. Kathleen, you have a great day. Tear, tear. Love you. See you in the office very soon. Who is down here? I see our administration. Nicole, you have a great day. Oh, they're gone there. One, one. Okay. Who is the 228? Is that you, Deb? That's me. Okay. Uh, can you stop recording this part? I certainly can. Thank you.